how do I pass robot inspections? In this video, we're talking about robot inspections, but primarily for the 2024 season crescendo. Every year, the rules are generally the same, but there are slight variations from year to year. Robot inspecting is primarily just to have a safe robot, but it's also to make sure you're following the rules. You need to pass robot inspections at every robot competition that you go to. During robot inspections, you work with the robot inspector to make sure that you're following the rules as well as your robot is safe. We want you to play the game. We're going to help you fix the rules. We're not there to be hard on you. We're there to help you be safe, help you follow those rules, and also help you fix those issues. If you fail, it's not the end of the world. You can go back and do an inspection as many times as you want till you pass. We want you to play. The robot inspectors go off of a checklist and you can actually get this checklist online. So ahead of the season, make sure you pass inspection at home so you don't have to have a long inspection. The checklist is broken up into six major components. You have size and weight, bumpers, mechanical, electrical, pneumatic systems, and power on check. The first category is size and weight. Um, size and weight primarily focuses on weight, frame perimeter, and starting config. With this category, you want to make sure you look at this way ahead of time when you first start designing your robot. You want to make sure your robot's underweight and well within the maximum dimensions. Robot weight from year to year is generally 125 pounds. That hasn't changed in a while, but the frame perimeter has changed and tends to change quite often. Starting config just refers to the configuration in which your robot starts, which is usually all appendages inside the frame perimeter and within a certain height cap. The most common inspection failure in size and weight is the size and the weight. You're over that weight limit or your overall perimeter is larger than expected. These particular attributes are integral to the design. Changing this at competition is usually not possible, so make sure you pay attention ahead of time. It is possible, but I saw someone literally hacksaw the robot in half, <laughs> cut out two inches, and then bolt it back together. It doesn't work as well after they do that. No, for some reason it's bendy. <laughs> this is the general bumper construction. Uh, you must have a blue set and a red set, or as a lot of teams will do, is reversible. Bumper numbers must be visible from all sides of the robot. Bumpers must be easily removable for inspection. Bumper design varies from year to year. This year, you are only allowed to have a maximum of one half inch between bumper segments. The biggest failure with bumpers is they're not rigidly mounted. You should be able to lift your robot by the bumpers, but don't. Please lift from the frame. The third section on this checklist is mechanical. In general, the mechanical section is to cover safety of people, safety of robots, and safety of the field. The biggest one that I've seen failures for is unsafe energy storage, which is large springs, elastic devices, pneumatics. Safe energy storage is crucial so that you don't harm any people, robots, or the field. When you're working in the pits, make sure you discharge any pneumatics or uh, put safety pins in for your springs while you're working on the robot to prevent injury. The other big things are no damage to robots, no damage to fields, and no sharp edges. So on every edge of your robot, make sure you go around with a file and sh file down any sharp edges. The fourth and most important section is electrical. Many of the electrical components on the robot are heavily regulated. There's a list on FIRST website specifying exactly what part numbers and model numbers are allowed for many of the various components. All of your electrical devices should be easily accessible and visible for one, the robot inspector, but also for troubleshooting your electronics. When it comes to batteries, only a single 12 volt lead acid battery is allowed. The main breaker must be easily accessible to easily power on and off the robot. When wiring your robot, make sure you use the correct amperage breakers for your application, as well as use the correct gauge of wire as specified by first in the rules. All wires must be of specific color as specified in the rules. There are some exceptions for this if it is manufactured by the manufacturer with different colors. You can always alter the color of the wires using colored shrink tubing. Only one motor per terminal on your power distribution panel or power distribution hub is allowed. Custom circuits are allowed on your robot. However, they may not control any actuators, servos, or relays on your robot. One thing to take note of is that your robot frame must be electrically isolated from your battery, both the ground and the 12 volt rail. Uh, during inspection, we will use a multimeter to check the resistance between the two and make sure there's not a short circuit. The electrical inspection rules on this list are to help guarantee safety, but also help make sure your robot lasts the match. The next section is pneumatics. Pneumatics is the most commonly failed section on an inspection. The first part of your pneumatic system is the compressor. Only one compressor is allowed per robot, and it is specified that it can have a maximum of a 1.1 CFM flow rate. The compressor must be powered by the PCM, the PH, or a relay module. The pressure relief valve must be directly mounted to the compressor. A pressure switch must be wired directly to your pneumatic control hub or your RoboRio. No modifications to any pneumatic parts are allowed, and that includes painting them. A vent plug valve is necessary on all pneumatic systems to allow you to fully vent the system. 
Pressure gauges must be visible on the storage side and the working side, also referred to as the high side and the low side of your pneumatic system, and they must be easily readable. The storage side of your robot can go up to 120 PSI, while the working side can only be at a maximum of 60 PSI. Pneumatic solenoids may only be controlled by the PCM, the PH, or a relay. Pneumatic systems are a highly regulated system for a reason. They are extremely powerful, but they can also be very dangerous if done incorrectly. The last section is the power on check, where we'll power on your robot and make sure you're ready to play. Specifically for the power on check, this is an opportunity for you to show the inspector that you know your robot. It's also very important that you do know your robot. You should know where the valves are. You should know where the gauges are. You should know how to power on your robot and where to find a battery and how to plug a battery in. The power on check may be done with a tether if you've already programmed your radio or if you don't have your radio in your robot. The robot signal light is used to communicate what mode the robot's in and is needed to be seen from three feet in front of the robot. The RSL must be plugged in directly to your Robo Rio and must flash when enabled and be solid when disabled. During an inspection, the inspector will ask to see the driver station. They will confirm your team number is set correctly in the driver station and that you have the correct version of the driver station. Lastly, the robot inspector will guarantee that your robot does indeed power off when you click the power off button on your breaker. So that's the end of the inspection. Might take you a couple of times, but you'll get it eventually. Keep coming back, keep trying again. If you make any changes on your robot, make sure to come back and get reinspected and reweighed. All of these rules exist for a reason and they are there to keep you safe. Inspection can be a very straightforward process if you've read the inspection checklist and you've gone through it yourself. And that is how you pass a robot inspection.